Are schools gun-free zones, can they be under the Second Amendment? No, they cannot. Today, we're going to talk in detail about what the notion of dicta means in the rule of law and why it's so important to understand this to defend why it is simply not true that government can ban guns in schools. We're going to break it down in one minute when we get back. Hey, folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of many books, including Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. Big announcement coming up very soon. Just submitted my last book uh, to the publisher for final review. Uh, should be getting publicized very, very soon. All right, folks. Now, very important topic. I want you to understand how to discuss this as a constitutional attorney. That is whether or not governments can ban guns in schools or on school property. The answer is constitutionally, they really cannot. But we're going to talk about some of the arguments that the anti-gunners raise and why they're simply fatally flawed. To begin with, let us remind everyone that when the Second Amendment was adopted in the year of our Lord, 1791, along with the rest of the Bill of Rights, there were no, there were no government laws, no government laws that banned guns on schools, school property, or campuses. The only authority at the time of the founding that exists speaking to the issue of guns on campus involves certain college campuses where schools prohibited their students, did you hear what I just said? Their students, their college students, from being able to carry guns or have guns on campus. Now, this is very important to understand that at the time of our founding in 1791, the second one was adopted, schools were not gun-free zones. I repeat, schools were not gun-free zones. The most that the historical record of historical laws on the books, the most that one could say about schools and guns at the time of the founding is as follows. That some schools prevented students from being able to carry guns, but the reasons why they did it and the how they did it is dramatically different than what's going on today in the 21st century where government agencies, whether it be states or localities, are banning guns on campus. Now, just as a reminder, under Bruin, the way you interpret the Second Amendment is you start with the text of the Second Amendment, of, of the, of the, Second Amendment the right of the people to keep and shall not be infringed. Once the text is implicated by a modern-day gun control law and certainly a government law that bans guns on campus for anyone, implicates the text of the Second Amendment. And once it implicates the text of the Second Amendment, the burden shifts to the government to show long-standing historical laws, actual laws on the books, not just some historian coming in to tell stories, but there's a particular kind of history the Supreme Court cares about when it comes to figuring out whether or not the founding fathers viewed a particular type of gun control law to be consistent with the meaning of the Second Amendment. And that is to look specifically at actual laws on the books. Those laws could be statutes. They could be regulations of some sort. They could be Supreme Court cases or court cases or common law something along these lines, but there have to be actual laws on the books that were actually enforced. This is what the anti-gun community absolutely hates because the reality is if you go back to the founding period, there are very few gun control laws on the books. And why is that? Because the same people that would have enacted gun control laws at the time of the founding were the exact same Americans and our founding fathers and the people, i.e. we the people, that embrace the right of the people to keep in their arms as a fundamental right, so fundamental that it came forth and was set forth and codified in the Bill of Rights, which again, as you know, the Second Amendment doesn't create rights. It simply enforces or codifies pre-existing rights that were already that were already there and always there in the United States, even before we the United States. So with that said, again, the methodology text, once it's implicated by modern gun control law, Burns just the government to show a type of historical regulations, meaning a long-standing tradition of firearm regulations of some particular type. And again, 
One of the things the Supreme Court said in Bruin is to figure out whether or not something is an analog law, which means a similar, a sufficiently similar law at the time of the founding to the modern gun control law, is you're supposed to look at the how the law was enforced at the time of the founding versus the how today's gun control law is enforced, as well as the why the law was enacted at the time of the founding versus the why the modern day gun control law was uh, enacted today. And that's why, for example, when you're trying to see the anti-gun community is trying to use, for example, fire code regulations that said you have you were limited to the mat you couldn't have massive quantities of black powder in your homes in like the city of Boston. And that was the why that was the case was because they feared the town burning down because everything in Boston was made of wood and you might have a conflagration of the sort that burned down the entire city of London, England in I believe 1666. So they didn't want that and that's why you had black powder regulations at the time of the founding is a concern about fire and burning down cities, which means that the why um, of them cannot justify a modern day restriction on let's say the cap capacity of a magazine because the why the anti-gunners have enacted laws that restrict the capacity of magazines to 10 rounds or less is because in theory they're arguing it's about crime control or restricting the ability of people to have self-defense weapons. The why has nothing to do with fears today about uh, those magazines burning down a city. So the why of the founding era gun, uh, founding era fire code laws involving black powder um, quantities in a home cannot justify the why uh, or the law that bans uh, or limits magazine capacity because the whys of the why they were enacted were dramatically different. So with that in mind, the question is, why at the time of the founding were there laws or regulations, whatever you want to call these for the sake of argument, that restricted the students, right? Again, there were rules about students not having guns on campus. But why was that the case and how was that done? Well, the, it turns out that the why students were not allowed to have guns at the time of the founding on certain campuses was because of the doctrine of, ready, in loco parentis. In loco parentis. What does in loco parentis mean? All it means is simply that someone is acting in the stead of, or they're acting on behalf of, or in the place of a parent. So in loco parentis just means that I am acting like I'm the parent over a kid where the kid is actually not my child. And that is the notion of why the, at the time of the founding, some of these universities, you know, banned guns to be carried and held and owned or possessed on campus by the students because the school faculty were acting in loco parentis over the students. And remember, at the time of the founding, the age of the students in college were much below or much lower than they are today. To give you an example, I believe Alexander Hamilton started college at King's College in New York City at the age of 16. Today, very few students start college until they're really 18, 19, or 20. They're much older than at the time of the founding. So the reason why this in local parentis argument, or this fact, I should say, destroys the anti-gun argument about banning guns in schools, and we'll get to Heller's dicta in one minute. The reason why it is, is because the reason why the faculty at the time of the founding were allowed to or enacted these regulations on the students was because they were acting as if they were parents at the time of the founding. No one, and this is key, no one at the time of the founding, and no one today, has any dispute over whether or not parents, hear me out, parents at the time of the founding had every right to control what the minor, their minor children did with respect to guns. In other words, there was no dispute that if you were the parent at the time of the founding and you had children, you controlled whether they had guns, what kind of guns they had, what they were allowed to do with the guns, and so on and so on and so on. The parent had the authority at the time of the founding to decide what the kids did with firearms in all respects. And therefore, and you got to connect the dots here a little bit, but think hard for just one moment. Because at the time of the founding, the parents undeniably had authority 
to decide what the kids did with guns, whether they had guns or otherwise, and what they did with them. Could they hunt? Could they not hunt? Because the college faculty administrators that took in the same kids to college and stood as in loco parentis over these students, the faculty was in effect the parent over these young children that were going to college at the time of the founding and exercise it in local parentis. And because, and here's the key, because there was no dispute that parents had authority over kids to determine what happened with guns and the kids, so too does the faculty at the time of the founding have the same legal authority and power, if you will, to decide what the kids at the on campus at the time of the founding, the students on campus at the time of the founding could do or not do with guns. And thus, those regulations that said those kids could not have guns in campus fell within the in, in local parentis authority. Now, why is all this extremely good? This is all extremely good for Second Amendment supporters. Because today, today, in the 21st century, there is no argument, there is no argument that today's faculty members, today's college administrators, today, the 21st century, there's no argument that those faculty members or those administrators are exercising in local parentis over today's college students. Today's college students are 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years of age. And for those of you that maybe watch college sports, they get even older and older for you know strategic purposes because older kids tend to be bigger and better athletes, blah, blah, blah. I won't bore you the details. But the point is, there's no suggestion that today, you know, the faculty at Harvard, let's say, is the parent over these college kids because at the time of 18 these college kids are considered full-blown adults they can vote they can join the military they can enter into contracts they are complete total independent adults in all respects and therefore today in the 21st century the college faculty members and the college uh, professors are not i repeat are not 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 are not exercising in local parentis authority over today's college kids. So therefore, if the anti-gun movement today tries to say that there's examples at the time of the founding of colleges banning guns uh, among the students in 1791, that may be true. But the reason why and the reason how they did so was in the name of in loco parentis because then the faculty members were exercising in loco parentis over the 1791 students on campus. But today, the how and the why of the gun bans on campus has nothing to do with today's faculty or administrators viewing today's students on campus as in loco parentis authority. They don't view the kids on campus today as being children that they have to exercise in loco parentis authority over. In fact, all that's going on now is that these governments today in the 21st century are banning guns on campus for the purposes not of, hey, I'm the parent, you're the kid, we're going to tell you what to do. No, they're banning guns on these campuses because they are fearful of crime, right? It's a crime anti-gun agenda. It's not the I don't want my kids to have guns agenda. It's totally different. The how and the why is completely different then and now. So that's very important to understand this. So when you hear even about, so first of all, schools at the time of the event were not gun-free zones to the extent they were gun-free zones. They were only for the students, but the only reason they were for the students at the time of the founding was because in loco parentis, that is no longer applicable today. And therefore today, even students cannot be banned from having guns on college campuses as I see it. And certainly no adult faculty member or administrator or anyone that's not a student, there's simply no historical basis for government law that says that. Says that. Now, the last point I want to make is this is the language that the anti-gunners like to quote from Heller, uh, this dictum from Heller. Let me read it to you now. Heller said, quote, although we do not undertake an exhaustive historical analysis today of the full scope of the Second Amendment, nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on longstanding prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of firearms. Now that is the language from Heller, and that language about schools being sensitive places that is what the anti-gunners say that the Supreme Court already decided these are sensitive places, but that's not true because 
First of all, that was not needed to decide whether or not DC could ban handguns because that language was unnecessary to the ultimate decision in Heller that says DC could not ban handguns in the home. That means that language that I just read to you is known as dicta or dictum, meaning language that's in an opinion that's not essential to the ultimate holding or decision of the court in that particular case. Now, here's the key. The anti-gun movement wants to treat that as if it's the gospel, as if it's like the Bible and Holy Writ that must be followed by everyone at all times. But the Supreme Court literally is saying that, hey, you know, we're nothing about the Hiller opinion is touching fingers with those issues because we not, did not deal with them. Now, it's particularly important for two reasons, because in the Bruin case in 2022, the Supreme Court specifically narrowed down the scope of what might be a sensitive place, i.e. a government-mandated gun-free zone. Again, a sensitive place is a euphemism for government-mandated gun-free zones, where they get to disarm you, right? That's what a sensitive place is, euphemistic, euphemistically, a government-mandated gun-free zone. And in Bruin, they actually narrowed it down to just three places. They said the three sensitive places that existed at the time of the founding in their view is legislative assembly halls or chambers like Congress, uh, the U.S. Capitol, uh, courthouses, and of course, they said polling places. Those are the three places. They did not reiterate the school as a sensitive place, which makes a lot of sense. Now, I should mention that the Supreme Court and none other than liberal Supreme Court Justice, now retired Stephen Breyer, actually made fun of the notion that dicta could be binding upon a future Supreme Court because dicta is not binding on future Supreme Court cases. So even though the Supreme Court in Heller references schools as a sensitive place, it's not binding on them because it's dicta. Here is what Justice Breyer said in a very amusing comment about a dicta from a decision from, believe it or not, 1893 that declared that tomatoes were vegetables, even though in reality we know that tomatoes our fruits. Justice Breyer, in the case of Kurt Sang versus John Wiley in 2013, wrote the following. Most importantly, this statement is pure dictum. It is dictum contained in a rebuttal to a counter argument, and it is unnecessary dictum, even in that respect. Is the court, meaning the Supreme Court, is the Supreme Court having once written dicta calling a tomato a vegetable bound to deny that it is a fruit Forever after? Question mark. Well, kind of amusing there from Justice Breyer, but it's actually a serious point because in 1893, the Supreme Court said that a tomato was a vegetable when in reality it's a fruit. The point being is Justice Breyer right there in 2013 is saying that the Supreme Court has all sorts of dicta out there and language that's not binding on the court, and that doesn't mean they're bound by it. So the fact that in 2008, the Supreme Court in the Heller case said that schools are sensitive places is no different than in 1893 when the Supreme Court found that a tomato was a vegetable when in reality it's a fruit. And that's all that even Stephen Breyer, the liberal justice, is saying that as a practical matter, the Supreme Court is not bound by dicta, especially when it turns out, out upon further, more detailed analysis and consideration that that first dicta statement uh, is false or is wrong. And therefore, it's pretty clear that even though in 2008 they made that passing reference to schools uh, being a sensitive place and just making an observation that Heller doesn't deal with sensitive places because it had no need to. It was talking about guns in the home. So it, why would it talk about what's a sensitive place out in public? No need to get into that. And there Stephen Breyer is basically making the same observation that dicta is not binding the Supreme Court. And because in this context of the Second Amendment, the argument that schools are sensitive places, that's dictum, not binding on the Supreme Court or any other court for that matter, which means that all these courts dealing with guns in the schools and whether or not a government mandated gun free zone law applicable to schools, whether or not it's constitutional under the Second Amendment, the courts must undertake the how and the why detailed analysis to figure out whether or not the justification by the government of these laws in terms of historical justification, of which there are none, whether or not they are justified in saying that these are government mandated gun free zones, i.e. schools are, and they simply are not able to do so for the reasons why I just articulated, which again is that schools at the time of the founding were not gun free zones. The only people that were restricted were students at certain campuses. And as I've articulated in this video, the only reason why they were restricted is because the schools were viewed as parents 
in lieu of the actual parents under the doctrine of in loco parentis. But that doctrine is no longer applicable today to the relationship between faculty on the one hand and students on the other hand. And thus the how and the why of those regulations at the time of the founding are different than the how and the why of the regulations on banning guns on campus are today in modern America. And because of that, the even the an, the alleged analogs at the time of the founding deal with students being banned uh, from having guns are not an analogs that can be considered today in fights over whether or not uh, governments can ban guns in the schools by for anyone, uh, including by the students. Okay, folks, well, I hope you learned a little bit of something here today. The four boxes are done about dicta and uh, guns in schools. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and resubscribe. We're trying to get to 150,000 subscribers as best as we can, as fast as we can. Don't forget to follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner, and we will see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up, table 2A.